You might have seen on social media, did anyone see that we got some exciting news? Anyone saw that? And you were like, what could it be? Were you thinking that? That's what we wanted you to think. We wanted you to go, what could it be? What's happening uh, in the life of the church? Well, there is some good news, and it's related to the building. We've been renting here for three years, just over three years in this building. And now I'm just, I'm going to be totally honest with you, okay? So it can't leave the church. Okay. For three years, we've been renting here, and uh, we always felt that if the opportunity came about that we were able to purchase this building, we would do it. Why? Because we believe that what we do here makes a difference in our community, and what we do here should carry on, not just in our lifetime or in our kids' lifetime, but in our kids' 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 lifetime. And so we felt it was important that when we were able to do it, we would try and buy the building. And so in the last couple of months, there's been a lot of negotiations happening in the background and and backwards and forwards. And and you can understand that this is a difficult thing to let go of. If this was your church home, you can understand that. And so it has been a sensitive and somewhat difficult time of trying to navigate that. But we finally come to the point that this week on Monday, we signed a sale agreement. So you can praise God for that. It is exciting because it means that once transferred happens, the buildings, it's ours, it's our home. You know, it's, it's wonderful to rent a home, and it's wonderful if you have the opportunity to rent a home, but if you have the opportunity to buy a home, there's something very, very special about a home that's yours, and uh, we trust that this is going to be an incredible move for us, and I think that there's probably people asking themselves the question that I would be asking myself if I was sitting down there. How much? <laughs> Some of you are not even shy. You're like, what's the figure? Give me the bottom line here. How much is this thing? And you know what? I am going to tell you. Why? Because this isn't a background thing. This isn't a my church or an eldership church thing. This is your church. You should know because you're going to be a part of making it happen. That's the reality. You've been a part of making it happen so far, and you're going to be a part of making it happen into the future. And so I think it's fine that you know. I don't think it's a secret. Is it a secret, Darby? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Should have checked that before. 6.5 million. That's what we're paying for the building. Now, some of you are going, wow, that's cheap for such a big building. And some of you are going, huh? Did you say six and a half thousand? No. Six and a half million is what we're paying for the building. And to say that it's a stretch would be one of the biggest understatements I've said all week. Okay, so it is a stretch. We have 30 years to pay it off like a conventional or normal bond. But if I'm being honest with you, and I am, we are trusting God that we can pay it off a lot sooner than 30 years. How soon? I don't know. Do I want to say the end of the year? I really do. (laughs) I really do. Do I want to say the end of next year? Yeah, that's still fine. I don't want 30 years. I don't want 30 years. We're trusting God that it's going to happen a lot sooner. But let me, t- let me answer something, because some of you are saying, that is an incredible amount of money. Couldn't the church just give it? Look, there's a lot of weird, complicated things that have happened in the background of this thing. But here's the reality. Every month, we pay rent. When we pay off 6.5 million rand over 30 years, it's the same as we're paying right now in rent. So instead of paying rent that escalates at 10% every year, or whatever it is, 6 or 7%, we're paying and we're actually going to own the building. It's the same amount of money. But we're trusting God that we'll be able to pay it off a lot sooner than 30 years. And so I hope you're trusting God with us for that. It's a huge step financially, but we believe it's worth it because we believe that this is a generational church that's going to go on, that's going to keep making an impact, and, uh, and so that's what we're trusting for. There's a little cliche that I read that, say, that says, where God guides, He provides, and we're trusting for that. I know that's not a Bible verse. I can't give you a Bible verse for that, but you do see it throughout the Bible. When God leads you, and we do believe that God has led us every step of the way, I promise you, if you don't know that this is miraculous, that an Enchia church could sell to a Pentecostal church, You think that's normal? I promise you it's not normal. I promise you it doesn't happen all over the country. There's a miraculous 
bunch of things that have worked together, and we believe God has been behind all of it. And so, where God guides, we trust that He will provide. And so, what I'm going to ask is that you would stand to your feet, thank God for the step forward, and then we're going to pray together. Can we just give God <laughs> praise? And let's pray while you're on your feet. Father God, we do thank you for this step forward. We thank you for this home. We thank you that it, it suits us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's a great base. This isn't the end of things. This is a great base for us to reach out from. And we thank you that you've provided. We thank you that you've been a part of every discussion and thought and negotiation and everything. You've been a part of it all. And Father God, we pray right now that you would provide in a miraculous way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. When we make that last payment, church, whether it's next year or the year after, <laughs> or in 30 years' time, in 2051, <laughs> that's awful, we will have a party in church and we will celebrate. Amen. You can take your seats. Awesome. So that is the good news for today, and we're going to get to the message right now. We've started a series called This Is Us. Now, lots of you enjoyed the elephant in the room. If you weren't a part of the church at that stage, or you weren't around, or you didn't, we were mostly online at that stage, we did a series called The Elephant in the Room where we dealt with topics that are easier not to deal with. I think that's the way you could put it. And we dealt with them, and people really responded. They loved it. They found it helpful and encouraging, and, and we're so grateful for that. And people say, can we do more of that stuff? Now, we will do more of that stuff. But this series on values is just as important. It may not be as controversial or topical or, or anything like that, but it is so important that we know what our values are as a church. You need to understand that everything we do is, is fenced in by our values, why do we do a baby blessing? It's because of our values. You're going to see what our values are, and you're going to go, oh, I see. Why would we buy a building in the heart of town? You're going to see. It's got to do with our values. Everything we do, small and big, every decision we make is actually filtered through our six values as a church. And so it's important for you to know that. And what we're hoping is that you don't just know the values. Oh, that's great. Last week we did reaching out. Well, we hope that you don't just know that, but that some of you actually embrace that. And you say, you know what? I want that to be my church, a value for me in my life and in my church and in my spiritual life. I want that to be a value. I want the value of reaching out, not just to be something the church does, but something I do, that I can do in my workplace, at home, with my friends, at school, and so we're doing this series, and we've got six values, and those values are the guides to what we're going to put money and energy into, what things we aren't. They're going to determine which projects and ministries we support and which we don't. It's our values that help us to decide which things are good for us to get involved in and which things are better for other people to get involved in. And so it's a great opportunity for us to express those values in a couple of weeks. And uh, last week, as I said, we finished off. We did a two-part, and it's the only one that's going to be two parts. We did two parts on reaching out. Sara started. And with all of our values, we've got two sentences that help to understand what that value is about. Because if I just said reaching out, I could go reaching out to who, to when, why, how, uh, and so we try and give a little bit of structure to that. And so when it comes to reaching out, we believe that people matter to God. And so they matter to the church. The second phrase, the church does not exist for us. We're the church and we exist to reach the world. Now, last night as I was going through my notes, I thought the best way to know if this is a value is almost to flip it, is to reverse it. Imagine we said we don't believe that people matter to God. You would go, what? What? We do believe that. That's good. That's what you, we want you to say. And so they don't matter to the church. Ever been in a church that could have that as a value? People don't matter. Sad, but you get them. The church does not exist for us. Imagine we said the church does exist for us. Let's make you as comfortable as we can make you. Was the sound a little loud today? Don't worry. Next week we'll turn it down for you. 
Was the coffee a little strong? We'll put a little less in next time. Imagine the church was for us. It's not. See, our value is that the church does not exist for us. We are the church, and we exist to reach the world. And so when you flip it and you reverse what the value is, you can see, hey, I actually do stand for that. I don't believe that people don't matter. People do matter. They matter to God and they matter to the church. And those are lovely words, but we want them to be more than just words. We have kids ministry in this church to reach out. It's part of the value. We have youth ministry in this church. Benny, the youth maestro, <laughs> leads youth ministry. Why? To reach out. You mean we employ someone. We have leadership structures. We, yeah, because we want to reach out to teenagers in our community. We have young adults to reach out to young adults. We have banners at the front to reach out. We have projects like Stationary Drive and others to reach out. We have a preschool so that we can reach out. Reaching out is part of who we are. And so many of you make that possible. And Sars spoke about how we're called to reach out. She spoke closer to home. We're called to reach out at home in our workplace, with our friends and family. But then last week we had Anna and Adele, that lovely couple, who are our missionaries in Lesotho. We support them financially on a monthly basis. And he spoke and he opened it up a little wider. So it's not just home and work and, and, and friends, but it's province. It's community, it's province, it's country. And so we support them in Lesotho because we believe in what they're doing there. They're planting churches and they're raising leaders in another country. We buy into that because reaching out is one of our values. Can you see now how it filters what we do and what we don't do? So we're going to take a look at our second value now. So in, technically it's part three, but it's value two. Okay, so here it is, growing personally. This is actually really important. And here are the two phrases that explain what I'm talking about when we say growing personally. We believe in the importance of personal integrity, mature character, and wholeness. We are committed to our ongoing personal spiritual growth and development. In other words, if you come to church week after week, month after month, year after year, and nothing changes, you don't become any more like Jesus after three years than you were in the beginning, wouldn't you agree that something's wrong? Wouldn't you say, well, I enjoyed the worship, the coffee was a bit strong, these things happened, and uh, we are pretty much, that's it for kids, you know, that's it for church, I didn't get much more out of it. Wouldn't you go, there's something wrong then? Because one of our values is that we would all, myself very much included, would grow personally, would grow spiritually, that we would develop, that we would become more like Christ. The Bible word for that is sanctify. That's the complicated word that means becoming more like Jesus. And we would hope that that's a desire. It's a value of our church. We'd hope it become a value of your life if it isn't already. And so instead of telling you three areas that you should be growing personally, I'm going to make this more raw this morning, more real, more vulnerable. Because I think that for too long, we've sort of avoided preaching into some of the darker and more difficult areas of our faith journey. So here's how I'm going to cover the value today. What are some of the things that stop me, Dolan, from growing personally and spiritually? What are the barriers that stop me from making progress? What are the things that keep tripping me up? Because what I'm hoping, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on this one, is that I'm not the only one, is that some of the stuff that stops me from growing personally might be some of the stuff that stops you from growing personally. So, you want to know what the big things are in my life? You're just full of questions today. First you want to know the price, now you want to know what trips me up. I'll give you it, and let's see. Doubt, ongoing sin, and laziness. Maybe you've got your own list. I told you this was going to be raw and vulnerable. I hope you can deal with this. It's easy to tell you what you need to work on in your personal spiritual growth. I promise you. 
can give you 10 points there. But the reality is that to make personal spiritual growth, all of us are going to hit these roadblocks. All of us are going to find these spaces where we thought, I wasn't in that space last year. I wasn't in that space five years ago. I was running strong. Everything was perfect. I was happy. And all of a sudden, I'm in a different space. All of a sudden, I'm with different friends, and and they're telling me different things, and I'm hearing different things about spirituality and Christianity. All of a sudden, I'm not in my school youth context. I'm in a university context, and, and people aren't speaking the same about church. Where I come from, everyone's a believer. We all go to youth. We all go to church. We all lift our hands. But now in university, I'm the weird one. What happened? In my workplace, I don't speak about faith because, you know, it's awkward. People have made up their minds. They don't need someone Bible bashing them. Or I'm lazy. I know that I want to grow spiritually, and people from the stage talk about having a quiet time and a devotional life, and we're going through devotions as a church, but quite honestly, when I get up on a Monday morning or on any morning of the week, the last thing I want to do is pick up a book and read it. Can we just be real for a second? These are things that inhibit us. They stop us or they slow us down when it comes to growing spiritually. So maybe like me, you also desire to grow personally, but that desire doesn't always become reality. Sometimes my desires and my reality are quite far apart. Can anyone relate to that? Make me feel better right now. (laughs) On a physical level, let's go there first, because I know you can relate to me. I desire to eat healthier. No one else. Everyone's like, what do you mean? Peak condition. What are you talking about? Why do I need to eat healthier? On a physical level, I desire to eat healthier. And then once I've put the girls to bed, and it's half past eight, nine o'clock, guess what I feel like? I've got to have chocolate. It's very important. I'm watching TV. It's Netflix and chocolate. Don't even think of the other thing. It was Netflix and chocolate. And so that's... I'm telling you the truth. I want to eat healthier, but that's the time I want to whip out a rusk and dunk it in my tea. And I'm not good at having one rusk. Never been good at that. I don't know how people do one rusk. I don't. I don't know how people do two blocks of chocolate. I'm not that guy. And so I've got a desire to eat healthier, but my reality Sarah every now and again throws a branch of broccoli onto my plate. Ask her how much I love that. What about exercise? I desire to get in shape. And don't tell me rounds of shape. I desire to get in shape. But when mornings are getting darker and colder, guess what? My desire and my reality... hmm, drift big time and it becomes tough and those are physical examples but it's exactly the same in my spiritual life I desire to be more like Jesus in every area of my life but sometimes that desire and reality don't line up I desire to have regular devotional time with God every day I desire to not struggle with doubts and unbelief I desire to overcome my sinful habits and not always feel like a failure in those areas. Can you relate to what I'm saying? You don't have to say which one you relate to. But the reality is we've all got stuff like that. And if you don't, I desire for you to help me. The truth is our desire and the reality don't always match up. And if you can relate to that this morning, then let's trust God together that through God's Spirit and His Word, He would help us to take a step forward, that He would reach deep inside us and begin to transform those areas that haven't yet been transformed. You know, when you got saved, that wasn't the instant transformation. You were declared righteous in God's sight, but there's an ongoing process. And there's not a person on the world who gave their life to Jesus and everything was transformed. Doesn't happen. 
It's this process. And I think a lot of us get discouraged in the process because we realize, well, it's not as easy as I thought it was going to be. It's not all about raising my hands and singing worship on Sunday because Monday is coming and Monday is hard. All of a sudden, we realize this isn't a sprint. This is a marathon. And some of us have got 40 years left, some of you less, some of you much more. But you realize, hey, this is an ongoing thing that I'm with here. But here's the point. It's never too early or too late for us to grow personally. And so don't be discouraged. Don't feel like, oh, I've missed out. If I started earlier, I could grow more. Maybe that's true. But have you heard this before? When's the right time to plant a tree? Now. It's just now. You can regret that you didn't have it two years ago and now you've got shade. You can live in regret. When's the best time to plant a tree? Right now. When's the best time to start growing personally? Right now. And so there's a particular passage of Scripture that actually helps me so much when I feel like I'm constantly missing the mark. And it's Romans chapter 7. Listen, if this message stands out for you, Romans chapter 7 is a good one to go and just do a couple of verses on each morning, each night, whenever you prefer to read. Because in this, you can see Paul's wrestle. And I'm grateful that Paul wrestles like we wrestle. So chapter 7, verse 15, Paul's clearly going through the same kind of struggle. And he says, I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Can you relate to Paul? I don't understand myself. How did I get here again? Verse 19, it's just a couple of verses later, he says almost the same thing. He says, I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Sound familiar? Well, like Paul, so many Christians find themselves in that same spiritual battle. We desperately desire to do what's right, but we struggle to overcome our rebellious, sinful nature. And so we fail, we fall, we falter, we do the things we hate and that we know are wrong. And when we mess up, don't we often just feel like, oh, weary, disheartened, overwhelmed. And then we start questioning, why is it so hard to be a Christian? Isn't it easier if I just wasn't? I wouldn't have this constant wrestling Why do I keep doing stuff I know is wrong? Why do I keep sinning if I'm meant to be a new creation? Does that ever run through your mind? I'm a new creation in Christ, and yet, look at my life. What's going on? Well, personally, I'm encouraged that Paul, this incredible, mature believer, understood that just because we love God, it doesn't mean that we'll be perfect, and it doesn't mean that we'll always obey Him. Even Christians who love Jesus still make mistakes. Why? Because there's a war going on. Because we are constantly at war with our old sinful nature. It literally feels like sometimes there's two people living inside you. Have you experienced that? Where there's this wrestling and it's just one of you. Are you schizophrenic? Is there something wrong? But I think in a way you do. The Bible speaks about your old sinful nature, and it speaks about your new spiritual nature, and they are both constantly fighting for the place of influence in your life. They are both fighting for the driver's seat, and you wish that your old nature got out when your new nature came in, but it didn't. It just moved to the passenger seat, and he is like the worst passenger you could have. He is like telling you all the time what you should be doing with your feet and your hands and steering and where you should be looking. He is your driver's ed instructor who just, hey, did you look? Left, right, hands, 10 to 2. What about the brakes? What about the clutch? What about the handbrake? Have you changed gears in the right time? Have you looked down the... And and, and it's constantly nagging at you. Your spiritual nature just wants to go. But he keeps taking the wheel and frustrating it. You felt that battle in you? It's like your old nature is just waiting for an opportunity to rear its head. It's like when you're with friends and there's this temptation 
to gossip about someone. And your old nature wants to take the wheel. It's like when something frustrating happens and you're tempted to lose your temper. It's like when you're alone with your phone or your computer and you're tempted to browse the wrong websites. It's like when you wake up in the morning and you have the choice to hit snooze for another nine minutes or get up and spend time with God. It's like when you're not married and you're tempted to cross sexual boundaries. There's a permanent, constant wrestling inside of every single Christian that isn't there inside of every single non-Christian. And so you say, hey man, Christianity is a crutch. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Christianity is not a crutch. You think Christianity is easy. It's way harder. Listen, it's easier not to have a, a spiritual nature that keeps wanting to take control and, and wanting to have influence in your life. It's much easier not to, surely. But we don't get that option, do we? Honestly, I've got friends that are tired of this battle. I've got friends who have just said, it's too much. No one else seems to have to fight like I have to fight. I'm done. I'm done. I'm tired of feeling bad when I'm not getting victory in an area of sin. I'm tired of defending my faith to people and pretending I don't have doubts myself. I'm tired of wishing I was more excited about reading the Bible and praying. And they say, I'm out. I'm throwing in the towel. They're tired of that constant internal battle between sinful nature and spiritual nature. And so here's the difficult thing, and this is where we round about to today. One of our core values is growing personally. And many of us desire that, especially on a Sunday. But if we're honest, when Monday comes, it can be so, so hard, and your desire and your reality can drift. So how do I grow personally and spiritually when I struggle with my own sin, doubt, and laziness? Well, let's see where Paul gets to in his wrestling with these questions, and it's a little further on in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 to 25. He says this, and he carries on. He says, I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God with all my heart. Is the problem that Paul doesn't love Jesus? Is that the problem? Is the problem that we don't love God? No, that's not the problem. He's saying, I do love God, but I still do the wrong thing. But he says here, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Have you ever felt that way? Yes. What have I done? What an idiot. What am I throwing away? What am I messing this up for? What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And then he says, thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God. What does he mean by that? What does he mean the answers in Jesus Christ our Lord? Because if there's an answer to this stuff, I need something more tangible than that. What does he mean? The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, all of us were slaves to sin. He makes that absolutely clear. But thankfully, Christ intervened. He is the solution to our fallen condition. Who will free me from this life of sin and death? We're delivered by God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, we still battle with sin, but we don't need to be slaves of sin forever. At the moment we trusted Christ, we were declared righteous by God. You need to hear this, because if you struggle with these things, and maybe you've got other things that stop you from growing personally, maybe for you it's not doubt and ongoing sin and laziness, maybe there's something else that just keeps on blocking your way, maybe it's resentment or bitterness or whatever it might be. But understand this sentence that I'm saying now. At the moment we trusted God, we were declared righteous by Him. And the Bible speaks about it almost like you're taking off a coat and you're putting on a coat. And we've got our old sinful selves and nature, and it's like, this, it's like a coat, and I don't have a coat as an example, but it's like you take that off when you accept Christ. 
And then what do you wear? Well, Jesus says here, wear this. And you take his coat of righteousness. And when God looks at you, and there's judgment because you're a sinful person, he doesn't look and see the sin that you've done. He looks and he sees Christ's righteousness. And he says, you're okay. And so something miraculous happens when we get saved. Something incredible happens. And we are declared righteous in an instant. You need to hear this because if you're struggling with guilt and doubt, they can make you feel like, hey, I think I've lost my salvation. I think I took off this coat, threw it down, and picked up my old coat again. I don't know that I'm acceptable to God anymore. Let me tell you something. When you gave your life to Christ, you are declared righteous by God. There's forgiveness, there's repentance, there's a turning away, and there's a turning towards Jesus the one who rescues us. You are declared righteous. Now, what's happening is that we're experiencing the gradual process of becoming more like Christ. And I'm sure you all know this, but this is a lifelong process. This isn't something we say, I've mastered this thing. Here I am. I've meditated under a tree for 20 years, and I no longer feel the way I felt. It just doesn't work like that. This is a wrestle we have till the day we die. And during this process, sin still likes to creep in and corrupt what God is doing in us. But there is a day coming, and this is a day of hope. There's a day coming when we will be made perfect, when we will get our new bodies, when we will be sinless, and we will experience the fullness of our salvation. But for now, it's war. It's war. Get used to it. Prepare for it. Be okay with it. Because it's life, and it's war, and it's sinful versus spiritual. See if you can pick up this big takeaway from today's message on growing personally. I'm going to read two more verses from Romans, this time chapter 5, but it's something else Paul said, which I just think is so wonderful. It's chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. He says this, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. So now we've got a law that says, don't do this, don't do that. Oh, so that's wrong. Yes, that's wrong. Okay, perfect. So, so the law showed me what was wrong and what was right. But as people sinned more and more, listen to this, God's wonderful grace became more and more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is grace. As much as we've got this battle, and as much as we're not going to ever reach perfection while we're alive and breathing on this planet, God has given us grace while we're here. Now that grace, we understand, isn't a license to sin. Oh, well, there's grace. I can do what I want. Oh, thank goodness. No, that's not what it's talking about. But thankfully, when we miss the mark, when we mess up, when we have doubts, When laziness wins over doing what's right, God has grace for us. We can be forgiven. There is grace. And the beauty of God's grace is that we are no longer judged or condemned for each and every sin or shortcoming. So remember this. On your worst day, God's grace is sufficient for you. Your greatest victory has already been won. Today, God is at work in your life, slowly but purposefully making you more like Him. So be patient in His process and trust His perfect timing. Don't lose hope. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. Let me sum up what we know today. We know that we want to be growing in our personal and spiritual life. In your mind, you can tick that box. We also know that our old nature is fighting against that. We know that sin is a constant reality in our lives and that we struggle with doubts, laziness, and constantly doing what we hate. We know that we will fight this battle until we're with Christ. But we also know that God's grace abounds for us. His grace is enough for you and it's enough for me. We know that when we are weak, He is strong. And we can rest in that. And I want us to end today reading something. It's called the Serenity Prayer. If you've ever, 
you would have seen it in some movies. If it's part of the AA's way of doing things, it's actually a prayer that was written uh, by a guy named, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, maybe, hopefully. And, um, and he put this together. So this doesn't come out of the Bible. But as a godly man, there's some stuff here which I never really understood how deep it actually is, how meaningful and purposeful this is. So you might know the first four lines there. And we're gonna read through this together as a church. I'm gonna read it quickly. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Are there things in your life you have no control over? You desperately wish they would change, but you actually can't do anything about them. Can anyone make it rain? If you can, it's a good time. There's some things you don't have control over. God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. It's a well-known phrase, but I think that it has a lot of depth and meaning. And it goes on, and it's just so, so helpful. I'm going to ask us to do something. I know it's a little bit unusual. I'm going to ask that you would stand with me. We're going to say this. And look, if you don't feel, oh, I don't know what I'm saying here. I'm not sure I want to pray this. What, what are they making me pray in church? You don't need to pray. It's not a problem. We're kind of just saying this as a prayer and a declaration for our own lives. If you're comfortable with that, go ahead. I'm not going to lead you down some weird prayer, and at the end, you're going to say something you regret. It's a powerful prayer. And so let's go through this line by line. I know it sounds a bit strange, but let's do that. And then I'm going to pray for us as a church. Is that okay? Let's do that. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Father God, I pray for all of us in this room, everyone who's watching, everyone who's listening. Father God, we desire to grow spiritually. All of us desire to know you more, to love you deeper, to experience closeness with you. And yet all of us are tripped up and held back by our sinful nature. God, we we do say sorry for that. We say sorry that sometimes we give our sinful nature the steering wheel way too easily. Lord, we say we have doubts. Help our unbelief. Help us where we've fallen short, where we don't understand, where we're confused, where we don't have the answers. Help us in our unbelief. Help us through our laziness. Help us where we can't seem to get victory over sins in our life. Father God, I thank you for all these things. There is grace. God, I thank you that even when we get to the point of throwing in the towel, of walking away, Father, I thank you that there is incredible grace. And I thank you, Lord, that we have people like Paul who struggled with this stuff and told us about it. We struggle. Help us. Lord, every day, every day, let us lean on you. Let us realize our deep need of you more. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. Well, that's value number two, personal growth. We desire that. We want that for us because in this case, the more of us that start getting it right, all the church is going to be able to do.